a friend of mine was standing, actually the daughter of my friend, was standing in line to the amusement park. Suddenly, oh, a man, an absolute stranger, turns around, faces her, and says, do you know where the city of unfulfilled dreams lies? No, follows the answer. The man, uh, the man continues, in the cemetery, he turns away. The girl is standing there in complete silence. She doesn't know what to think or what to say in response to that. And then the man turns again and says, life is too short not to follow your dreams. You might as well end up in that city. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Irina Baker who's going to share how our soul and our bank account are tied together. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward. How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. While you're there, you can sign up for a monthly email where I share the best articles I read this month, let you know about upcoming episodes, and share a little wisdom. You can also listen to coaching calls under the coaching calls tab. I also share the most interesting articles I read every week on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash richersoul. And there's also a Facebook group where you can ask questions, inter interact with other listeners. I'm not sure where today's quote comes from. I may have made it up. You can't buy your way to happiness, but you can buy your way out of misery. We have a double-edged sword with money. Irene and I are going to discuss this in more detail today. I just finished reading Expert Secrets. It's Russell Brunson's book about how to create a mass movement of people who will pay you for your advice. There's a quote in there that struck with me. All people have desires. Very few people have ambition. Less than 2% of the population is actually ambitious. I find that sad. I also realize how they create funnels of emails designed to get you to spend money on stuff you don't need through some amazing storytelling. Maybe I need to use more of these techniques to help you take action and become a little bit more ambitious. So last week's action step was to create your life plan and live it. I know that's not going to happen in a week, but are you doing something to create your life plan if you don't already have one? This has come up a lot. I can tell you it's super important and it creates so much clarity, which makes life so much easier. So if you need help, reach out. Let's get this done. Today's guest is Irina Baker, who is a speaker, best-selling author, and spiritual self-awareness mentor. She helps people connect with their inner power by increasing self-awareness and changing consciousness. 
Irina holds three master's degrees. She's extensively trained in spiritual studies, hypnosis, and has more than 20 years of professional experience in successful speaking and mentoring American and international clients. Irina has been on her own profound spiritual journey for the past 24 years. She's been a guest on numerous radio shows, author of five books, including a bestseller, and a recipient of two entrepreneurial awards. Let's meet our guest. Welcome to Richer Soul, Irina Baker. It's great to have you join us today. Hi, Rocky. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm excited to learn from you today. We always like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Very interesting question, because I grew up in a former Soviet Union. Now it's called Russia before it was the Soviet Union. Uh, very different experience because money was condemned, actually. God didn't exist. And all we praise very highly was the, were the books. And even the books were very hard to find. So it was a very interesting, different situation that many people might not even imagine because it's so different from America. I've been, my mom was a medical doctor, highly respected, very well loved. Clients would come or uh, patients would come to her for 30 years. She's been practicing medicine all her life. She's retired now. And my family comes from medical doctors. I have three or four of them in the family. But money was always scarce because there at those times, doctors and teachers don't get very much. So <laughs> there is an interesting story that I even heard it from a friend of mine who, who is from Russia as well. And she told me that there is a person who is now here in America. She's a talented stylist, hairstylist. And she, when she was a child growing up in the former Soviet Union, she dreamed about being either a doctor or a stylist. And her father said, you need to think about how much money you're going to make. Look at what doctors make and look what stylists make. And she became a stylist. <laughs> that was even shocking to me to hear. <laughs> but that's the story. <laughs> and I think every country has different values for who gets paid. And even today, I think in Germany, Physicians are not paid as well as some of the other professions, and, and that occurs in other countries as well. So many things are local and regional, and understanding those differences is important. That's right. And also, there is a second point I would like to make. Not only the money was condemned as, per se, as an official propaganda, uh, but there was another point to it. We believe that to have money was actually dangerous, dangerous to your life. I grew up in a city that is a 1,000 year old city, more than a 1,000, uh, very historically cultured and with a lot of um, universities and industry. It's a capital of one of the republics and it's a more than a million population city. But at the same time, it was famous in the former Soviet Union for its mafia. And crime was, crime rates were skyrocketing at that time. And they and the mafia, they were actually only mafia or corrupted government or actually communist government could have the money. Other people, not really, not so much. And we always knew that if there is a Mercedes driving through the city, not many of them were at that time. Not many people drove at that time. We didn't have cars. We used public transportation. And we would know that eventually that person would be killed. Or uh, later on, uh, the business started maybe in small steps. They, they started allowing small businesses to grow or to start. And there were a little of a few, uh, no, 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 many kiosks or small little places of sale that they would open up, people trying to do business. 
and mafia organized its own business. So the mafia would come to you who, who are the owner of the small business or small kiosk, and they would say, well, either you pay us and we will protect you from our other mafia or we will burn your business, we will burn your kiosk and your business will be dead. And we would hear a lot of times in the morning, we would hear that that last night, some this kiosk or that kiosk or that place got burned. And everybody knew why it happened. Somebody did not pay enough to mafia or didn't or reject the payment or whatever that was. So it was dangerous to have money anyway. You know, it's funny because I was just watching a movie with my kid this weekend about Jimmy Hoffa. And it's much the same in the United States. Back in the day, in certain places, the mafia did very much the same thing. If you didn't pay them off, then they came after you. You have to be careful. It was funny watching the movie, How Many People Died it, from right. Different Hits. And it's the same thing. I guess there are some similarities. Thankfully, at least in the United States, most of that has been cleaned up today and we don't have to deal with that. I don't know if that's still the case in Russia now, or is it much better? I haven't been to Russia for a long time. I came to America in 95, so it's 24 years. And I don't even know what the situation is. I really, I don't even want to know. I am here. This is my home. And I don't want to know anything about Russia whatsoever. <laughs> but I think it did change because now it's big business, big money. They, they are after more uh, different goals. <laughs> Their goals have evolved, I believe. <laughs> and that they have. And you have That's to change it. with that. So I know you have a daughter. Are you doing anything different to teach her about money? It's an interesting question. And yes, I do. I do have a different policy, so to speak, because she is turning 10 in January. She's a sweet girl. And of course, I want her to know the best what I know. Of course, she resists. She doesn't want to talk about any of this stuff. She's interested in her own stuff. But I, my position is a spiritual position. I do not approach the money from the physical standpoint. And it's, of course, it's a whole, would be whole lecture on this position and explanation. So I wouldn't go into it. But what I teach her that we need to have both physical and spiritual together. We cannot have just spiritual or just physical. We have to be to have it both. So that's my principal position. And of course, she knows what I believe about ascended masters and about Jesus Christ and about God. And these are my beliefs and I connected with the money because I do believe that the divine provides the money. The money comes from the light. The light goes through the physical body, gets manifested in the outer as physical wealth. So this is to, in my belief system, the money is not produced in the physical world only. It's connected to the spiritual as well. And we'll dig into that in the book in a moment. Before we do that, there was a phrase that jumped out at me, and I, and I guess it, maybe you can tell the story of the aha behind this. But basically, you said, I was the only one who was totally responsible for all my heavy traumas, problems, general discontent, and unhappiness. What did you mean by that? Hmm. <laughs> Good question. And I actually want to specify right away that you are, I believe, quoting my book, Bridging Your Soul and Your Bank Account. That means, well, a lot of times people do not want to take any responsibility whatsoever. They blame the government, the economy, the market, the neighbor, the cat, neighbor's cat, neighbor's dog anybody and everybody and anything and everything but themselves. So if they lost the money due to bad market conditions, that's the market and nothing to do about them. Oh, poor me. And when you have such an attitude, 
then you are at complete mercy of the physical world, of the matrix, I call it the matrix that surrounds you. And that's just a mirror of what's inside, inside of you in the subconscious and unconscious world that is vast, vast world inside of you. So until you, if you have any problems any with money or anything, health, relationships, work, career, business, money, as we said, then you have to take responsibility that everything that you have right now, you experience at this moment is the result of what you have created in the past. And I talk about past lives. We lived centuries and centuries and centuries. We're not new to this earth. We're not new. And there is not just one life. This is my firm belief. People can believe what they want to, but this is what I believe. And it comes from my experience, my professional experience and everything I stand for. And so I have a question. How often do you find people who take that stance that they are totally responsible for everything in their life versus people who want to blame others? <laughs> I will start with many, many years ago. I lived in Florida and I was, uh, I was teaching at the college and I was asked to do seminars and I will tell you why I start with a long time ago. And I'm, I was teaching seminars and I was teaching women about taking responsibility. And they used to fight me on that. When I would say, you are the creator of your own reality. And that was, like I said, many years ago, that was not accepted well at all. They would fight me and they would resist and they would say, heck no, we're not. And then I would provide logic and explanations and would teach them and they would accept at the end. Now, a lot of people have heard this phrase. They accepted it. It's, to me, it's becoming a cliche that you are the creator of your own reality. But you can hear this phrase all the time. You can agree with it because a lot of people do agree with it. However, the life shows, the actions show that they don't really follow it. It's one thing to read about playing a piano, but another thing is to apply what you have read about and really practice the piano. There are two different things. The same here. It's okay to, ex to accept it, but if you're not practicing, if you're not re really believing every single minute of the day that every single thing about you is the result of what you had created in the past, what's inside of you, what set of beliefs you have, and what spiritual, generally, whole spiritual way of, it is a very spiritual way of looking at things, at the physical life. That it is. And there's a lot of people who are not living in congruence with their beliefs. They, they say they want to do X, but then when you look at their actions, they don't meet what they say. And so that's that's a struggle. And people have to, I think sometimes people need help in those situations to create awareness and to say, hey, you said X, but you're doing Y. And a lot of times I think people are even blind to that. They don't even realize that they're not in congruence with themselves. Right, Rocky. You mentioned a key word, actually, awareness. People are not aware. And I will tell you everybody, or I can't say everybody, but a lot of people are asleep, asleep to the high awareness, asleep to that there is a much bigger world inside than they know of. So it's very different. So when you just look and follow the traditional way of looking at business, looking at your life, looking at your career, looking at relationships, well, people are asleep. Why do you think most people are asleep? There is a term in spiritual circles, spiritual awakening, right? I'm sure you've heard of that. Yes. And many people take it for granted. Okay, well, spiritual awakening. And when you ask, did you have a spiritual awakening? Usually those who knew, I mean, those who had it, they are aware that they did have a spiritual awakening. If they're not, then they're asleep. Because again, we are not physical beings only. We are not here on physical earth to live one life 
to, I actually, I want to interrupt even myself to go when I was 14. I was 14 years old and I was in the former Soviet Union where absolutely no spiritual reality was nothing, not existent of any kind. And religion was prohibited. God did not exist. So nothing like that. And at 14 years old, I started wondering what, what is the meaning to my life? To study at the university, okay, and then to go get a job, okay, and then to maybe get married, have children, retire, and die. What is the purpose of that? Why do I have to do all this? What, what, do, what do I need it for? So that was my question, and that actually started my, I guess, my development in that field, then I found the book that was translated into Russian. Thank God. I didn't know English at that time. And that was Dr. Moody's book, Life After Death, I think it was named. And I, when I started reading it, I was, my body was shaking. I was resonating with that. And I started finding that, oh, we do not live just one life. There is life after death. There is life before death. And life continues. We are immortal. I'm not talking about the ego. I'm not talking about the physical body. I'm talking about the spiritual being who we truly are. And the purpose of, and meaning of life is very different from what people believe it is. So when you just think about, oh, I'm just living my life day to day routine and I am not, uh, and that's my life. They don't even ask, what, what are you living it for? Why do you go to work? Why do you need business? Why do you need this money? To have big wealth and then what? When you die and then what? So <laughs> as you see, I'm passionate about it. <laughs> that you are. And so let's talk about the book. You wrote the book, Bridging Your Soul and Your Bank Account, The Complete Guide to Spiritual Satisfaction and Wealth. Why did you choose to write the book? I've written actually several books. And this is one of them. And what I do is I am on my spiritual path for officially for 24 years. And when I write the book, it's usually that I've processed the information inside of me. I have had releases, so-called releases. I mean, that means I've released uh, whatever blocks I needed to release at that moment. I've realized something new. And I needed to write the book. So I look at it. I'm very much in academic. I love academic environment. So I look at it as my dissertation or as my thesis to finish whatever that piece of spiritual development I'm going through. So my every book is usually the result of my next level of growth. And when I look back at my books, I already have grown from these books and I'm moving forward. So every time the new books comes out, it's usually the result of my next level, my next development and my next realization. So you wrote this a while ago, correct? Yes. And every chapter, every chapter, I would first do the processing and then I would finish the chapter because I couldn't write any chapter if I didn't do the spiritual work first. It's weird, I guess, but that's how I live. <laughs> so. What are you working on since you wrote the book? Well, that's a good question because I am working on my next goal and it's the ultimate goal of spiritual development. And I am not comfortable to talk about it yet because this one is very dear to my heart and I am in the process of very intense spiritual work to to that goal but i do not want to discuss it yet and that's fine mm -hmm. let's take a step back because i think this is where a lot of people struggle we mm -hmm. we put things in silos and buckets and so people look at money in one bucket and their soul in another bucket and the two shall not cross but you're saying they do cross, that they are together. They must cross. So why must they cross? Because we are not just physical beings. We are not just spiritual beings. We're in the physical body. 
So we cannot separate. It's like you go to a doctor for your teeth or you go to a doctor for your limbs or whatever uh, separated. But the, the body is a whole mechanism. You know, when you go to a cardiologist, you think it's the heart, but it's actually something else. In other words, the whole e the, the body is the whole organism, but the body is not just it. We it doesn't stop there. We have several bodies. In fact, we have etheric body, which is made of light. We have mental body. We have feeling body. We have other bodies. So how can you ignore? And that's what I say when people I sleep, people I sleep when they ignore that there are other parts to us, to every single person here on earth. If you are just concerned with the physical body, with the physical survival, let it be poverty or wealth, it's still survival on earth. It's still never enough. So if you're still concerned only with that, you are missing on the whole world that is a big part of you. You are a part of that world. And that world is actually more important than the physical. And <laughs> with my background in the, growing up in former Soviet Union, we were learning there that material reality is everything. It's the first. The spirit is the second. And actually, spirit doesn't even exist. So I came from the background where you focus only on the physical reality, on the physical body, because as I already mentioned twice, God did not exist. Lenin, I don't know if you've heard of Lenin, but he was the father of the revolution of 1917. His body was mummified, mummified, and it's kept still up to this day, it's kept in the mausoleum on Red Square in Moscow. So he was proclaimed God with small g, G-O-D, God. So everybody worshipped Lenin instead of true spirit, true spirit, true divine. And so that was the physical, highly ultimate worship of the physical. And then I moved to America and here on the money, every bill has in God we trust. Right. So it's a different reality. And here it's more connected, spiritual and physical are more connected than there. So I came from one extreme and then I traveled to another extreme because now I do believe we have to bridge the gap between physical and spiritual. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Can you explain the difference between the lower self ego versus the higher self soul? That's. Yes, it's very easy to explain. And that's actually also adds to the previous question. Why do we bridge the gap? The ego is the physical body, the physical body, the intellect, the logic, thinking, all of that and the physical body and the personality, because the personality only lives one time. If your name is Rocky, Rocky will be only living one time. But what the, there is more than Rocky than Rocky, right? <laughs> if I'm making it clear, I'm Irina and my personality will live one time. But in the le next lifetime, I could be I will be somebody else. And so that's the ego that in the that's the physical body, the intellect, the conscious mind. And it's very active and it's actually usurp divine power. And now it's in power here. The ego rules the world, actually. The intellect rules the world. But the second part of us is the higher self. It's actually, and here is the uh, interesting example of how I outgrow my own books. The soul is actually, I've discovered after I've written this book, the soul is actually our feeling world. So the higher self is actually the personal Christ and personal Christ. Every single one has personal Christ. And that's the higher power, the divine power. And that divine power has to be given power, actually. But the ego took it illegally. And we need to combine both. We need to hear and be in connection and have a direct divine channel to the personal Christ. And we also have to have ego on earth because 
that's how it's supposed to be. So Jesus Christ, for example, and I'm not going into religion, I'm just mentioning Jesus Christ as the master who was able to bridge the gap between the physical, the ego, Jesus, and the spiritual, Christ. He connected on a very deep level, on a very personal level. He was able to create a divine channel to the Father. He called him Father. And that's the personal Christ, the highest self in Jesus that he was able to... uh, Jesus Christ gave the power or gave the opportunity for personal Christ, highest self, to express through Jesus love, healings, everything. Because we know Jesus himself did not do the work. He mentioned many, many times during his mission that it's the Father who does the works. It's not Jesus. So it's Christ who did the work of healing, teaching, helping people, explaining spiritual things, encouraging them, awakening people. And, uh, and Jesus, that's the ego part. Jesus had to be present. He had to bring the body to the place where he could do the teaching so he could do the healings. Does that make sense to you? It does. So how do people start to channel or get more in touch with their higher self and their soul? Unfortunately, that's not an easy question because it's a spiritual journey and it usually starts with spiritual awakening. And spiritual awakening means I could tell you, give you an example of my awakening. And it's not necessarily how everybody wakes up to that. But this is just one example. Would you like me to? Absolutely. It was very, very, it was long time ago, 24 years ago. (laughs) I was very, because I moved from Russia to America, I thought that I escaped all my problems. And I thought I was so happy. I came to America. I celebrated. It was too good to be true. I was here. And now all my, all my problems and all my unrealized desires or whatever it was, I left behind. And I'm here. I'm starting a new life. And what I've experienced was it actually got worse. Internally, I started suffering. I felt so... I was trying to assimilate with American culture. I was trying to be really, I was trying to be an American in a short period of time because I loved it so much. I felt it as home and that was my home. And yet I was suffering. And there was a time when I didn't want to go back to Russia and I didn't want to live in America. I actually wanted to be on the plane and crash in Bermuda Triangle. And that was my secret desire. I didn't tell it to anybody. But that it was it was uh, um, struggle and I didn't know what to do, how to stop it and how to change it until one memorable day. That day I was in my office and I was typing. I was writing my first book that was in Russian and I was sitting at the computer typing it and and I was very quiet. And suddenly a thousand light bulbs just turned on in my head. It was an incredible experience because it's inside your head and you clearly see these light bulbs, not the bulbs themselves, but the light. It just was extremely bright, powerful light inside my head. And a realization hit me like a ton of bricks. Don't blame the mirror for your ugly face. Everything You are responsible for everything, the good and the ugly. And at that moment, I said, okay, I I, I accepted it. And I said, okay, if I am responsible, I'm going to go inside and I will find what's wrong with me and I'm going to change it because I am tired of this life. And that was my spiritual awakening. From that point on, I, the, my first step was to run to the Barnes and Nobles and get a bunch of books, spiritual books, and I started reading like crazy. I could not stop. And that was my preparation moment. And then, of course, I went on a journey. And the journey was step by step because you're being guided from, by, by the way, you're being guided by your personal Christ. And that Christ will lead you to the right moment, to the right mentor, to the right teacher, 
into the right lesson, whatever you need gradually to get to the place where you open that divine channel. And that's what I do with people, by the way. This is my work because I've been on this journey. I'm still on this journey. It's been for 24 years of my, from my spiritual awakening moment. And I've done everything possible education wise, none, even non-traditional education, plus my experience, my professional experience, everything. My life is devoted to my spiritual journey and helping others to do the same. Thank you for sharing that. Today's episode of Richer Soul is brought to you by Profit Comes First. Most business owners focus on top-line revenue, and while that's important, the bottom line, what you take home, and what's available to reinvest in the business is what drives continued long-term success. Hundreds of thousands of companies are using Profit First in their business. You don't have to learn fancy accounting systems or how to read complicated financial statements. You just implement the system and behave much like you currently do. However, you pay yourself first. As a certified Profit First professional, I help entrepreneurs and small business owners to grow their business profitably. Through my coaching and consulting, we ensure your business is on track and I'm making sure that you keep spending in line, increasing your profitability. Learn more at ProfitComesFirst.com or click on the scheduling link in the show notes to book a no-obligation call to see how Profit First can help put more money in your pocket. So. I noticed in one of the chapters in your book, you talked about moving to the moon. Desire is your destiny. Can you share a little bit what you meant about that? Yes, I will be happy to. And I came up with this um, with this term, moving to the moon, because to me, when some desire, I usually call it like moving to the moon desire that seems unobtainable, meaning You have that desire. Every single person here on earth, without exception, came into this into this lifetime, was born with a talent. And I will argue that point if somebody tries to argue with me. Every single one has a talent in some area of life. That person has aptitude. Every single person has aptitude to something, something that comes natural. It could be very small. It could be very big. It could be in between. But we all have something that makes us us, correct? We all have something to offer to others, to serve. We do. And because of that, this is our destiny, meaning we have to serve. We cannot keep this talent away from others. We have to share this talent. That's why we equipped with it. And we might be working on this talent developing in for many lifetimes, or it could be something new that we want to explore, but it is there. A lot of, pe- a lot of people are aware of it, and that's the dream that they have. Oh, I would love to be that, that person, or I would love to do this and that. But a lot of people feel that this is the unobtainable desire because it's like moving to the moon. Anna, you can't do that. We, we cannot. Somebody, maybe the government, maybe put you, send somebody to the moon, but we cannot personally. So that's why I call it moving to the moon desire. But it's there. I never wanted to be a ballerina and I will never be because that's not my desire. But I always wanted to be a speaker or a mentor, and I, I, and I am. So we have that desire, and when we have that true desire, we have talent for that. We have aptitude for that. And then if you look back at your life, you will notice that you've been led by life or by your personal Christ into the situations and lessons and education and whatever you had in your life to hone your talent, to bring you that desire. Maybe you didn't do it consciously, but it's there. So 
time goes by, you get better and better equipped to have your desire uh, be born and to serve the world. But it's your choice. We have a free choice. And I say, unfortunately, because a lot of people make that choice not to follow that desire and stay where they are out of fear. So fear plays, plays a huge part. It keeps us low. And many people do not pursue their desires, but they have them. And that's their purpose in life. One of the purposes. There are more. There are also spiritual ones. Does that answer your question? It does. And I think for a lot of people, they undervalue their talents because they're so natural and so good at something. Exactly. That they just assume everybody is. And then they, exactly. they ignore it, unfortunately, until you, you have to go ask around so that people can say, yes, I, I think of this when I think of you. And then you have to take the time then to go develop the talent. But I think the first step for a lot of people is just figuring out what their talents are, because I think a lot of times people don't realize what they are or they've been misled as to what their talents are. Absolutely. And then they dictate it to what they need to do. And that's very unfortunate when parents say, well, the money part. You have to think about the money and you have to go and be a doctor here in America or to be a lawyer. But the person is designed inside to do something else and could be very talented and could have money as well. But the person does not pursue it, the child, for example, or the young person, because parents said, no, you have to do it this way. So it's very unfortunate that. People are not aware or do not follow what they need to follow. Sometimes we're put on the wrong tracks and then you wake up and you go, how did I get here? This isn't what I wanted out of life. <laughs> exactly. And it's usually fear that, that drives us there. That it does. So you talk about the metaphor of a personal cash register. Can you explain that and how we unlock it? If you go to Target, for example, everybody knows here, at least in America, the person who is the cash register person, they cannot open that cash register just like that, right? They can't just say, okay, now I'm opening it. They have to send specific code or command for the cash register to open. Let's say you give them money and they have to give you change. And only then the cash register opens. It's not all the time. So the cash register is full of money. The cash register person stands in front of that register. Sometimes he or she opens it and sometimes he or she cannot open it. So what's the difference? I look at it as a metaphor for, for us because we are all, and I am very strong in my beliefs, so I will be bold here. Every single person who comes here who is born on this earth has the supply that is provided or given or allotted to this person by divine. So it's a big amount of money. So they could, we could be easily all wealthy in life. Every single one has this potential. Yet, how many people are not right there? A majority of people, they live in a never enough land. It's never enough money to go around. And that's because they cannot open that cash register. Of course, it's a metaphor. I speak in stories and metaphors always. So that cash register, I give an example in my book about the Soviet Union. Such a rich country, huge. It's even Russia now is still the biggest country in the world land-wise. It has all the resources imaginable, diamonds and gold and fur and oil and you name it, everything is there. How come that so many people, majority of people in the Soviet Union are so, uh, Russia now, so poor and they, they work the land, they work in this country, they live in this country and they have no access whatsoever. There is a key and they do not have that key. And it's actually, I have my first book, it's called Keys to Freedom, The Guide to Personal Power. And I talk about that there, about the key 
to actually mastery or here to key uh, in this book to key, it's the key to the cash register and you know what the key is any guess you tell me <laughs> the key is internal self value self worth even in the language if you talk about some person who is very rich and we say he's worth two billion dollars correct that's how usually people describe the person or in other on the opposite side we usually don't say it out loud but it's implied he is worthless the person who doesn't have any assets whatsoever and i never want to offend anybody i'm just explaining spiritual terms here because i always look at the spiritual side of things so the wealth has specific vibration. Never enough has specific vibration. Poor state has a specific energy vibration. So if the person does not vibrate energy-wise, specifically relate or the vibration does not match the vibration of wealth, that person doesn't have the code or the key to open that cash, cash register. The wealth is all around us. But... The wealth is not easily accessible because, again, it's inside. It's the self-value, very deep internal self-value. And I'm not talking about mindset because mindset deals with conscious mind. You can tell yourself up, uh, up to, you know, 100 years old. You can say, oh, I deserve it. I can have it. It's mine. But nothing will happen. Because conscious mind has nothing to do with it. It's the subconscious mind. It's very deep inside. It's the spiritual path, part of us. And we've talked about that in the past, is understanding that you are enough, which is basically what you're saying. And we have to do that on the inside. So how do we increase our vibration level? Again, it's, it's a deep process. It's if somebody tells you uh, like a lot of uh, um, money mentors or a lot of uh, physical like marketing mentors, they will say, come to me, go through my program and you will have a million in three years. I'm giving specific example of some mentor who is saying that maybe she doesn't promise it, but she says, well, in three years, you can be a millionaire. Well, can you or you cannot? You will go through that process. Some people will and some people will not. Why? Because those who will have that internal self-value and they, they have that potential. Many people will not because they don't. How do they increase it? They cannot go through a three-year, three well, it's a long, in other words, it's a long process. They have to be spiritually awakened, first of all. They have to take full responsibility, real responsibility, not on words, but really believe that it's all inside and it's all their own creation. And if they didn't make that money, they didn't open that cash register, that's, that means something is inside. Like I was told, don't blame the mirror for your ugly face. It's all about you, the good and the ugly. But unfortunately, there is no such thing as go to my class for five weeks and you will just get there. When people say, oh, clear the blocks. Yes, you have to clear the blocks, but it's a process. And in the process, the awareness is changes so much. The consciousness has to change. So the change of vibration means the change of consciousness and consciousness changes very slowly. However, the good news is. Once you start on the path, once, once you start taking actions, things do improve. So maybe the whole, whole thing will not be achieved in short period of time, but with each step you take spiritually, with each block you clear, with each realization you receive or obtain, your, your life will change in all respects. You have to show up and do the work. And keep showing up and keep exactly. trying and keep working on it. Exactly. So I know you mentioned going through a program. I believe 
you've had a lot of coaching and mentoring in your life that you've paid for. How has it helped you grow? Good question, because I do believe that mentors, teachers, instructors, those who guide us, they are absolutely necessary. Yes, I have all kinds of teaching, starting traditional university. I have three master's degrees. I have more than 20 certificates of the spiritual studies and all kinds of experts field studies. I also have, I spend more than $100,000 on marketing and business uh, training. So I um, was studying or training with high-end mentors and I wouldn't be here if I didn't do it. I wouldn't be helping my clients on such a level that I help now that their whole life changes, the cash register opens and whatever they need, it opens because of the spiritual development, I wouldn't be there. So a lot of times I look back and I say, wow, yes, it was a tough decision because you pay a lot of money. And how many people have walk around and say, oh, I have spendable money. I don't know what to do with it. Right. <laughs> Usually people know what, where to spend money and they don't have spare money to just they don't know what to do with it. And mentors to me are a must and spiritual mentors are a must as well. For example, right now we're doing interview. You are an expert in the material physical world, right, Rocky? You deal with money in a physical sense. I do. And I'm the one who is a spiritual mentor who deals with money in a spiritual sense, opening the potential for increase of the money or changing the consciousness to or in, increasing the awareness regarding the money and clearing the blocks and doing the internal work for your processes to be effortless and seamless. So mentors are a must, and I do believe that you have to be an expert in your field, of course. You also have to know about business and money strategies and marketing, because how can you be without it, right? If you're in business, you have to know how to operate with money or marketing in the physical sense. And you also need to have, well, mindset is a good thing because mindset, however, mindset comes on a conscious level and conscious level is where the ego deals in the physical world. It's very good. It's very needed. However, many, many people are completely unaware that there is number four area, which is spiritual change, spiritual development inside all the blocks and everything that prevents your success from being more higher success there as well. So there are four and there are mentors are needed and mentors speed up their, the learning curve because I'm all by myself going through spiritual journey. It took me 24 years so far. And when my clients come to me, they usually stay for I'm proud to say two and a half or three years. And when they do, they have accomplished so much. And I'm saying, why did I have to do 24 years when you have done it in two or three years? Well, because I'm there to guide them because I've learned the tricks of the trade, so to speak, even in a spiritual sense, and I can guide them like that. So the same with you. You've done your work. You've learned your mistakes. You made those mistakes, how you say it on your website. I don't want others to make, to repeat my mistakes. And that's where you come from. So they don't need to spend whole life learning from their own mistakes. So yes, mentors, I am must. And thank you for sharing that. And yeah, I help people so that they do have extra money so that they can make choices and say, what shall I do with my extra money? And how, what else do I want to experience in this life? And that's big part of it. We create that gap between what comes in and what goes out so you can make better choices and have more opportunities in this life. One of the things that you talk about is why women make less than men. What's the reason behind that? 
<laughs> I can give a long lecture or I can give a very short one and I will try to do the short one. The reason is, I again, I will be very bold here. Some might not agree with me, but I will say it anyway. This is the world of men. Men rule the world. By the way, do you agree with it or you would argue? I, you know, I think it depends. I think there are a lot of strong women who rule their men. And I think, especially in the United States today, what we are seeing is, especially in the, young, the younger generation, women are out earning their husbands. And it's becoming, I think, a big problem for many of the husbands of how do they deal with it and also for the wives of how they deal with it. So I think in the past, that was the way it was done. I think today it's kind of shifting, at least in the United States. I don't know what you're well, seeing. All right. It's shifting, but it's not there yet. Even all the fairy tales tell us Cinderella, poor thing, poor Cinderella. She needs a rescuer. She needs a prince who is rich and who lives happily ever after, even before Cinderella. And then he needed to rescue Cinderella. And she's poor thing, has no money and has to work hard. And a lot of a lot of examples of like that and many, many examples. It is still a world of a man. It is shifting and it has to shift and it will be shifting, but it didn't happen yet at large and especially in the whole world as well. And the reason I'm the reason I'm mentioning it, because men to me spiritually represent intellect. So if we start talking about spiritual terms, the world, the life here, physical life at this point is ruled by intellect. We make intellectual decisions, men and women, it doesn't matter. But we praise, highly praise intellect. And the second part that is super important, it's devalued. And what, what is devalued is the feelings. The feelings, if you are in business and deal with money, you will never go, you're not going to talk about Oh, how do you feel about the money right now? Or in the meeting, board meeting, nobody will say, how do you feel right now about this bottom line cash flow, what we need to do, right? Everybody's thinking and nobody's going to talk about feeling. Feelings are basically taboo. They are not allowed, especially in business. And they say it's not personal, it's business. And that means we will be dealing only on the inter intellect level. And women represent feelings. And remember, every single person has both male and female energies inside. So I do not discriminate anybody. I'm just giving, um, I'm just giving uh, representation, what it means to me in a spiritual way. And so intellect versus feelings. Feelings are devalued. So women who are born as women, they often come with no value. Or it's not that they have no value. We all have the same value, very high. But the belief is I am not valuable. My talents are not valued. And if we look throughout history, Oh, the boy can be uh, the king and it's a male bloodline and the girl cannot. Or we had girls, we need to sell them somewhere in slavery because only boys are needed. And it's just extreme examples from, the, from history, but that's how the world operates. Historically, the, va the women has been devalued. And that's the message that to everybody. Men have higher value. And so because of that, women still, so it's just shown, it represents what's inside of us. The outside world shows the smaller salaries that women get or the different maybe attitude or whatever it is that makes women receive less than men because it comes from inside. And those women who command higher salaries than men, they're actually using their male side. They usually, they're using intellect to really go there and do and be successful in the world. 
maybe I, I talk because I know you come from the physical perspective. Maybe I'm too complicated for you right now, but this is how what I teach and what I believe in. No, that's not complicated at all. I think that was very okay. clear. So thank you for sharing that. So let's talk about, there's one other thing that you talk about that I'd like for you to share with the audience, and it's the city of unfulfilled dreams. <laughs> Can you share that story? Yes. <laughs> A friend of mine was standing, actually the daughter of my friend, was standing in line to the amusement park. Suddenly, uh, a man, uh, absolute stranger, turns around, faces her and says, do you know where the city of unfulfilled dreams lies? No, follows the answer. The man, uh, the man continues, in the cemetery. He turns away. The girl is standing there in complete silence. She doesn't know what to think or what to say in response to that. And then the man turns again and says, life is too short not to follow your dreams. You might as well end up in that city. And I think that happens for a lot of us, right? Exactly. Unfulfilled dreams because exactly. of fear. And yes. because we don't think we're good enough. And when you go take action and you try, it's not that you're going to have success overnight. Like you said, you've been on a long journey. We've all been on long journeys. It takes time and work. And when you show up and do the time and work on your dreams, they will come true. And sometimes... You need help. And that's why getting coaches and mentors and connecting with others and reading books and going to seminars is how you continually improve to do that. Exactly. So based on our conversation today, what is one action step people can take this week to move forward? I would say, look at your life. You don't need to go anywhere. You don't need to do anything. You just need to look at your life and say, what do I live my life for? What is the meaning and purpose of my life? Because this one question can start a very different journey. It can start because once you, once you speak your desire or your question out loud, and you're very sincere to find out, then the personal Christ, the highest self, that part, divine part inside, will provide you with the answer, will provide you with people, with mentors, with books, like you mentioned, everything that will answer that question. And when you get that answer, while you are on that journey, life will change so much that you will not recognize yourself. And that is very true. Change takes time. And once you know your destination, and you start working towards it, it happens, and it's wilder than you can imagine. But you have to make that first intention. That's the intent that you set for the journey. You don't know how to get there. You don't know how you're going to accomplish anything. But you need to ask yourself, what exactly is my basically divine plan for me? What for my life? What exactly I'm here for? And the answer will surprise you. That it will. <laughs> It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? My secret is to be directly connected to my personal Christ, because I do believe that abundance, good health, great relationships, success in business comes from the divine. In fact, very famous Napoleon Hill. I know in America, most of the people know Napoleon Hill and his famous book, Think and Grow Rich. In his research, he found out that those people who amassed great wealth, all of them 
would connect, they knew the secret. And the secret was they would connect with the divine and would get inspired inspiration and guidance from the divine and then they would follow that guidance and they would great create they would create great wealth those people who did not do that who did not know the secret of connecting to the divine and going to the divine for guidance they did not amass any wealth and that's napoleon hill what did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner the same thing <laughs> If I would know before that everything is divinely connected and every all answers lie inside and I would have done what I've done now much earlier, I would be in a much different place. But it took me a long time to get where I am. And it's true. All the answers that we need for our life are inside of us. And that's where having a coach to help you find your answers and to guide you becomes important. Right. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Good question. Make sure you know what you are destined to do here, how you will serve others. Go within and ask your divine, your personal Christ self, what your purpose here in life find it don't go through life blindly don't try to chase money because if you have no potential for money inside without healing without changing you will never chase you will never catch the money so you have to follow what the divine plan for you is and it's inside and you came here equipped with the talent with the resources, with the aptitude and desire. So that desire must be fulfilled and you have to find a way to fulfill it and do it early. Don't wait too long. (laughs) And you said one important thing, which was you're here to serve and people need to realize if you want success, you get success through serving. And people sometimes forget that. Because people worship money instead of really having very different attitude. Unfortunately, it's a cliche, but it's true. We all chase, try to chase money because we have to survive in the physical world. We want to be comfortable. We want to be rich. But the truth is, that's the dead end. Money per se itself. Money is has to be there we have to be wealthy because poverty is actually a big sin it's not a good thing to have so money has to be there god wants us to be wealthy there is no virtue in being never in never enough land or being poor but we cannot serve two masters at the same time that is very true if people would like to find you and connect and learn more about your books, what's the best way for them to do that? My website, radiantmastery.com. Is that clear? Radiantmastery.com with my pronunciation, I mean. (laughs) And I will put that in the show notes as well. And people can just click on it and come find you. And I would like to invite people for a conversation, but only those people who have some urgent problem that they use all or some traditional methods of dealing with the problem, such as whatever physical steps they needed to take, they took those steps, and those physical steps did not work for them. Something was still inside and the problem still persisted, and they are ready and willing to try to look at spiritual side of things. I had a client who actually started with me and she's been with me for more than two and a half years already. She told me uh, that she tried, she came to me regarding money. She tried all the physical, not all, but traditional methods of dealing with money and nothing worked for her. And she was ready to try spiritual. And that's how we She got on the spiritual path. So those people who are interested in that, you feel that, yes, I've tried traditional ways and 
Now I want to try the spiritual approach and really see what will happen. Then I will, I will invite you to a discovery session with me. It's a complimentary session. You just need to go to, uh, to my website, radiantmastery.com. Click, click on the tab discovery session and fill out the application. And if the application is approved, we'll schedule an appointment and we will go from there. Sounds like a plan. And we'll have that all in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Rocky. The questions were excellent. And I was enjoying to, uh, to answer them and look back at my life and my journey and even my life in the former Soviet Union. So thank you for that. And I do hope that your audience, people who listen to your radio show, really ask yourselves, what, why do I live here? What is my meaning and purpose in life? And how can I serve? And those are excellent questions. Thank you. Do you know the meaning and focus of your life? We started this by last week's action step, which was the life plan. I have it written down as part of my life plan, including my eulogy. I may update it over time, but I know where I'm going. All my clients go through this process. The clarity is immense. It does take a few months to go through it. And you can hear all about the results in episode 160 with my coaching client, Marla. How are you spiritually with money? Do you feel you deserve it? Do you attract it? Money is everywhere. And when you help people and they are happy, they give it to you. The principles to create wealth and business profit are timeless. The same principles apply to other areas of your life. Just like the law of gravity works on the earth, the moon, and throughout the universe, you can use these principles to your advantage or disadvantage. But you can never ignore them because gravity affects you even when you don't know that it exists. When you know where you're going and have clarity with what you want, life becomes easier and distractions melt away. If you're still listening, you must have liked the episode, so please share it with a few friends. It can start a great conversation. I'd love to connect with you on the Facebook page and the, or the Facebook group, so stop by and say hi. What's preventing you from moving forward and who are you putting on your team to help build the life you deserve? Taking no action creates a far worse outcome in life than trying something and failing. I can help you achieve your goals through coaching and accountability. Just email me and we can start with a short chat to see if we're a good fit for coaching. For many people, one session allows them to take a giant leap forward towards their dreams. You can get me at rocky at richersoul.com or use the scheduling link in the show notes to book a time. I'd love to hear how you're doing and how the information I've shared has helped. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week and an abundant year.